you asked for it, you got it. Another Q&A to celebrate 1500 subscribers right here on this channel. Let's go! How old should you be to start taking creatine? I will say two things. One, out of all legal sports supplements, creatine seems to have this magical aura. People think it's a game changer, so they come up with all kinds of questions on timing, dosage, whether they can or cannot take it in their special situation, when it's really a simple, simple supplement with limited potential. And two, if you eat meat or fish, you're already taking creatine, you just don't know it. Coming back to the discussion about age. There is no cutoff point where you can say, now you're ready to take creatine. It's not like you will harm your body or it won't be effective when you're 13, but tomorrow when you turn 14, suddenly it's all systems go to start creatine supplementation. When you think about it that way, you see it doesn't make any sense. So it's not a question of age, it's a question of do I need it right now to reach my fitness goals. How do I strengthen my bench? I haven't hit a new PR in almost a year. I'm 15, 240 pounds, my max bench is 135 and I do bench at least three times a week. Ah, one of those great mysteries in life, how to build a bigger bench. The answer depends on how far along you are in your strength training journey. Someone who benches three plates would get a different answer from me than a 15 year old who's stuck at one plate because we're dealing with a beginner here. The first thing that catches my eye, and he didn't even ask about it, but I gotta point it out. You weigh 240 pounds at age 15. We know for sure that is not all muscle. Your body fat is too high. I've got some tips to get that under control coming up in another question later in this video, so stay tuned. As for the bench press, a few things come to mind. First is your technique without seeing your lift. I guarantee your form is nowhere near great. Setting up, getting tight under the bar, creating an arch in your back instead of lying flat like a dead fish, where to touch the bar on your chest, optimal bar path using leg drive, all things every good lifter knows and does. Technique will always be the limiting factor for beginners in all barbell lifts. Once you learn what good technique looks and feels like, your numbers will shoot up without doing anything else. To help you achieve it, check out my How to Squat, Bench Press and Deadlift DVD. I'll drop the link in the description. Another thing I gotta bring up is this. You're benching three times or more per week. I assume that is always the flat barbell bench press and within a limited rep range. Typically three or four sets of 8 to 12 reps. So you're not varying your training enough, which causes plateaus. I'm a big fan of high frequency training for a specific lift or muscle group when trying to bring it up. But I would save that for later when you actually need it to bust through a plateau. Later as in years later. You don't need that much frequency and specialization in one lift right now. Beginners get stronger in the bench press just from building the muscles involved in the exercise. Chest, shoulders, triceps. Are you doing dips? Are you doing push-ups? Probably not given your 240 pounds of body weight. Your goal should be to master these movements with your body weight first and then add external loading to build your upper body and gain more strength which will translate into a bigger bench press. Another thing that helps is to do different variations. Instead of always using a barbell on a flat bench, do incline at different angles or use dumbbells. Now you're rotating through a bunch of lifts that are similar but a little bit different. This added variety helps you get unstuck and it also makes training more interesting because different lifts hit certain muscle groups differently. For example, I get much better chest pumps from dumbbells than barbell benching. Close grip bench builds my triceps more than a regular grip and to target the shoulders more, I would do a high incline press. So bring down how many times a week you press with a straight bar on a flat bench and add more variety to your training. Finally, the most important tip to improve your bench press. Follow a proven strength program. You will not get anywhere with random workouts, which is what most guys do. A good training plan includes progressive overload and enough variety when it comes to exercise selection and set rep schemes so that you're able to make continuous progress. You don't have to think, just follow it and the results will come. Do you prefer the belt instead of using a handle like strongman style? He's referring to sled walks and sled drags. I like the belt better because it leaves your arms free, so you could argue it's more similar to the skating position. Also with a chin-up belt wrapped around your torso, you don't need another piece of equipment to do the exercise. Always something you have to think about when training at public gyms. Limited or missing equipment. Next one, not really a question, a comment on my video about Steno Chara's off-ice training where I showed how the tallest player in the league squats deep. So there's no reason for anyone else to hide behind the excuse, I'm too tall to go all the way down. 
He says, very true video. Same goes for people who play basketball. They think quarter squats are beneficial when in actuality they are far inferior to regular ATG squats. As to grass squats should be done by every athlete in every sport. They are so good for you. No need to go heavy. Just get that movement mastered. Good video. Yes, like I have said countless times, there's a time and place for limited range of motion squats to improve joint angle specific strength in sports activities like sprinting, jumping, or skating. But it's not for weak beginners who don't know how to lift over a full range of motion with good technique. The problem is a ton of athletes abuse half and quarter squats because they are easier and you can use more resistance. It's an ego thing. More plates on the bar means you're the man. I use shallow squats only with my stronger, more experienced athletes where they actually produce results and only for short training cycles. Most of the year they squat deep and even in those training blocks where half or quarter squats are the primary squat variation, you should still keep deep squats in your routine. They don't have to be heavy. It could be as simple as doing a few full range of motion warm up sets before going into your half squat workout. The point is you want to maintain the mobility to squat all the way down because if you stop doing it after a while, your ability to go calf to hamstring disappears. You will feel tight and immobile in the hips and ankles. And if you take too long a break from it, you will very likely run into knee problems once you start doing them again. I've seen it many times. Athletes perform limited range of motion squats for months, then go back to deep squats and complain about knee pain. What did you expect? So even when full squats are not a priority in this training phase, keep them in your routine. Can you explain the hockey plyo and jump training phases? Currently, I think I'm at the more advanced stage, but I'm worried that I'm doing plyos or jumps that are below my level. If I did the kind of justice to this topic that it really deserves, this would turn into an hour long video, maybe in the future, not today. Instead, I'll direct you to one of my articles where I explain it all. It's the most in-depth piece I've ever written about jump training for hockey athletes and I don't just say that to sound cool or whatever it's a fact you can google hockey jump training and see what comes up nobody else has broken it down to the level I have so grab a drink sit down it's a long one with plenty of video examples but well worth the read I'll drop the link in the description great video I bought your book and loaned it to my 13 year old son's personal trainer he's a skinny strong kid and now eating like a man and we are seeing results what is a realistic weight gain goal for a 120 pound kid with three months of intense training with a few hockey clinics camps mixed in he's presently at 129 and wants to be at 140 plus by the end of august he's loving the way he feels on the ice with the extra strength and weight love to hear it this is exactly what i keep saying on this channel in my book in my daily email newsletter once you start eating big and lifting for real that is going to transfer to your game the extra strength and muscle mass you now have is gonna amp up your confidence because you know when i go in the corners I'm the one coming out with the puck. As for a realistic weight gain goal for a 13 year old who weighs around 120, 130 pounds, I don't like to obsess over numbers. There's too many factors at play here, genetics being a huge one. One kid could go from 120 to 140 pounds in three months, another kid goes up to 128. So what? Focus on the process, not the numbers. Also, even though it's difficult for a teenager to get fat from eating a lot of quality food, there comes a point where the extra calories you eat are turned into body fat. Because the body can only build a limited amount of muscle over a given time frame, a week, a month, a year. Once you exceed that limit and if you keep eating more and more, your weight will still go up, but now too much of that additional weight will be body fat. Not what we want. My point is this, there is no rush with athletes this young. It's about consistency, accumulated over time. Think about it. If you can figure out training and nutrition, at least on a basic level, at age 13, you'll be so far ahead of your peers you cannot imagine. Because the average 13 year old hockey player does not eat enough food to optimize growth. Likely eats a lot of junk food, frozen pizza, sugar, cereals, candy, energy drinks, all that nasty stuff. And if he's in the gym, you can bet he's not making gains. I remember how I was at 13, a clueless newbie working on the machines, half repping squats and chin ups, doing leg presses. It was a joke. So instead of thinking too much where you're gonna be in three months or a year from now, just focus on today. Did I eat well? Did I train well? Did I sleep well? Yes to all three, then you win the day. Keep stacking those wins day after day, week after week, and it will be impossible for you to fail. 
Whether you get to 140 pounds by the end of August or in December makes no difference in the big picture. Thanks for the video. Can you talk about speed training during the season? I'll give you the overview for in season speed training. Of course, this depends on the level of competition, how many games per week you play, and what the schedule looks like. Other games sprinkled every two or three days like in the NHL or mostly on weekends like at the college and junior levels. Assuming you have two games per week, pretty standard hockey schedule, you would lift twice and do one speed session. The problem with in-season speed training is with dry land sprinting. Because if you take several weeks off and then go 100% immediately after restarting, you risk pulling a groin or hamstring. So you really have two options. Either keep dryland sprints in your program throughout the summer, preseason, and in season. Don't take any long breaks. If you cannot do that, then perform jumps off the ice and do your sprints on the ice early during practice when you're fresh. Make sure you're well warmed up for it. You can still tear a muscle doing sprints on the ice, but the risk is lower compared to dryland sprints. How should I get back to training after a myocarditis? I'm not a doctor and I don't play one on the internet. I'm not in any shape or form qualified to answer a question like that. Talk to your doctor, hope you figure it out. Should I go into a calorie deficit since I already eat probably over 3000 cals and it's not healthy foods, it's junk. Should I go in a deficit or eat more healthy foods in a surplus? When you're fat to begin with, eating in a calorie surplus will just make you fatter. Doesn't matter whether it's healthy food or junk food. I see this misconception all the time. Guys thinking how cleaning up their diet without adjusting for calorie intake is magically going to transform you from fat to ripped. No. If you want to unfatten yourself, you have to be in a calorie deficit. Eat less than what you burn. So the answer to your question is eat healthy foods in a calorie deficit. Hello, thanks a lot for this video. Could you please make one bit where you explain how to gain hockey strength and power without having a lot of weights? I'm stagnating right now because my gym does not have a lot of weights for barbells and dumbbells are not heavy too. Thanks, Eunice. Whenever I get a question like this, it makes me wonder, does he not see what I see? And I'm not knocking the guy, I'm just pointing it out. He's saying he's stagnating, he's not making progress, huge red flag, and he also knows the reason his gym does not have enough ways to keep getting stronger. So rather than try to make it work at his crappy gym, because let's be honest, that's what it is, a weight room short on weights is not a real gym. It's a daycare for adults. The solution is to find a better gym, a gym with real equipment, more plates, bigger weights, Maybe you have to drive an extra five or 10 minutes to get to that new gym. But to me, that's the most logical solution because strength is built with heavy weights, not light weights. If your current gym has only light weights, you go to a place that has heavy weights. <laughs> Done. Conditioning right after jump sprint session, bad. I don't recommend it. Think about it. You just did your sprints, your jumps, you trained to be fast and explosive at or very close to 100% of your max. Now you're teaching your body to go slower for longer distance or time immediately after. No, you kill the neural adaptations that would otherwise take place from your speed training. So definitely don't condition right after a speed session. And if at all possible, not even the same day. Charlie Francis, a famous Canadian sprint coach, developed the high-low system where you would do speed on one day, that's your high-intensity training, and things like tempo runs, circuits, or other lower-intensity conditioning work the next day. And this cycle would repeat throughout the week. With team sport athletes like hockey, scheduling your workouts this neatly on different days is not possible because you're practicing your sport four, five, or more times per week, and some of those on-ice practices involve hard conditioning. That means you will have to make compromises. If there's no way around doing sprints and jumps on their own day, at least try to minimize the interference from conditioning. What does that mean? Do them at different times, not in the same session. Speed in the morning and hockey practice in the evening. And try to schedule speed workouts on days where your ice sessions are more skill-based and lower in intensity instead of back skates. Now you're maximizing your results from sprinting and jumping. Your thoughts on young hockey players under 16 weight training. A common misconception is that lifting weights will stunt your growth and you will remain a midget for life. I debunked this whole topic in my book, Strength Training for Ice Hockey. Go read it at hockeystrengthbook.com. I'm not gonna waste your valuable time here by repeating what's in the book, but I will add this. You need two things to maximize your results. And this goes for athletes of any age. A good program and good coaching. What I don't get is this. Parents will, without hesitation, spend a lot of money on skating and hockey skills lessons 
But when it comes time to pull out their wallet to hire a qualified strength coach to teach Junior how to lift, suddenly money is tight. Now we have all these hockey dads to save money and because they think they know better, teaching their sons how to lift. But only in very rare cases do they actually know anything about lifting. I get that the intention is good, but you're teaching your kid to lift wrong. At best, his progress will be limited. At worst, you're setting him up for injury. It baffles me. Why do so many parents think they are knowledgeable enough on the subject of strength training to even attempt it? How many dads teach their kids math or grammar or chemistry or history? Because most people realize, hey, I should let someone else who is trained and qualified in this subject to teach my kids. They can do it a lot better than I ever could. But when it comes to barbell training, everybody's an expert. You asked for my thoughts, just had to put that out there. How low to go on dips? Short answer, as low as you can without pain. Longer answer, the larger the range of motion, the more growth it produces. We have all seen those guys at the gym doing dips where they barely bend their elbows. They go down by two, three inches. You can kiss muscle growth goodbye when you do that. So you should sink deeper with the caveat that going shoulder well below elbow can be too stressful to the shoulder. Just like with barbell squats, you have to build up to full range of motion reps gradually. Most people are not ready for it on day one, especially when going heavy, their technique breaks down. Now you're hurt. Also, if you have previous shoulder problems, it's likely a good idea to stay above the riskiest position. When I'm using body weight or lighter weights, I go shoulder below elbow. On my heavy sets, upper arm parallel to the floor is the depth standard. Deep enough to make gains, but not so deep that I risk hurting myself. Anything above that doesn't count in my book. What about younger athletes? Cutting can be bad for your growth. He refers to my video about skinny fat athletes and whether they should bulk or cut first. Sure, if you're 14, I'm not gonna tell you to slash calories. That would be irresponsible. You're in your prime growth years. You don't even need to calculate calories. Don't worry about any of that stuff. Instead, focus on the quality of food. Eat your meats, fish, eggs, quality starchy carbs, berries, fruits, vegetables, Things everyone knows they should be eating, but skip for donuts, KFC buckets, and microwave meals. A young athlete will get leaner automatically just by making better food choices. If you're fat or skinny fat, no need for you to go on a cut. Leave that to the adults. Trust me, there comes a time when getting ripped becomes a lot harder, and to achieve it, you must track calories and eat in a prolonged calorie deficit. If you're a teenage athlete, you're blessed. You don't have to deal with any of that nonsense. Just eat quality foods until you're full, and you will improve your body composition. That's it. Q&A done. Thank you for watching. If you want to see more content like this, then give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already to be notified when my newest video drops. Also, if you want me to answer your question in my next Q&A coming soon, write it in the comments below. Have a fantastic day. I'll see you in the next video.